Good morning. Welcome back. Sunday, October 10th, 2021. This is a Sunday school lesson for Aceville Baptist Church. Uh, and I explored a Bible series. We're finishing up this week our study in the book of Philippians. We'll move it, be moving next week into the book of Colossians. Before we get started this week, uh, on this Sunday morning, uh, a little a couple of prayer requests. Pray again, uh, as we've been doing the last few weeks, that uh, you'll pray for those that's been affected by COVID, uh, those families uh, that have been affected by the loss from this uh, dreaded virus. Uh, we pray that you'll pray for each one of those families, that they'll find comfort and find comfort through Jesus. Pray for our country. Uh, if you look around, uh, as we've been doing this week, uh, the world is in a bad shape right now. Uh, the leadership of our USA, uh, the United States, needs God. It, it, God would be the only answer uh, to the problems that we're having right now in the United States. Uh, as our preacher preached uh, last Sunday, pray for the salvation uh, of our national leaders, uh, which leads us into today's lesson, uh, which is entitled Joy and Contentment. The subtitle this week is Believers Can Find Joy and Contentment in God's Eternal Presence, in God's Eternal uh, Knowledge, Knowing About Jesus. The teacher's book uh, gave us a very stark reminder this week. Uh, it said this, when we think life is so tough and things get so bad and so hard, always remember you can find peace and joy in life through Jesus. We were reminded by our author this week that Paul found joy and contentment even though he was in prison and most likely facing execution uh, by the Roman government. Again, this week I ask you to think about uh, the main word this week is contentment. Think with me for a moment. What is contentment? Contentment is a state of being happy, being satisfied, being relaxed in your present state. Uh, this week, uh, think of a dog laying in the green grass under a clear blue sky, just wallowing in the grass. Is that contentment? Think of taking a nap in a very comfortable recliner after a very good feeling meal. Uh, I used to do that pretty regular, but uh, here lately I can't seem to take a nap in the afternoons. I, I can only get to sleep at night now. But that used to bring me joy and pleasure and contentment. Uh, when I could take those naps. Think of you lying on the couch with your grandchild laying in your lap and you watching them sleeping. Uh, my grand grandchildren are all over six now and I still love to hold them, rock them till they're sleepy. Uh, what contentment, what pleasure I get uh, from watching them as they get dozy uh, and me sitting there holding them and thinking about their lives ahead of them. Uh, this week, I had planned to do uh, this Sunday school lesson on the side of the river. Uh, I had someone come to me this week uh, where I did the lesson outside a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they were able to share it with their family, and they come to me and thank me for offering that lesson. For offering that lesson uh, from the outdoors and how much it meant to them. So this week I plan on doing it outside, but uh, as you know, we've had a, a good bit of rain this week, so I was not able to get out, uh, find a good time to get out in the yard and do the, do the lesson. Uh, as we think about joy and contentment and peace this week, uh, what other ways beside the dog and the nap and lying on the couch after a full meal could you think of uh, that would help you express what contentment means to you. I'm sure most of us have a picture of contentment, but do you ever stop and see yourselves in a picture of contentment? Or is the world moving so fast that you can't stop uh, for a little while and ask yourself, am I content? Paul in today's lesson is finishing his letter to the Philippians in chapter four. In chapter four, he challenges the folks at Philippi uh, to pursue contentment. No, not laziness, 
not lack of ambition, not greed, not pride, but contentment, peace and contentment. How do you find contentment? Paul says, and it's the main thought of our lesson today, by finding peace in Christ and joy in each situation that you might be in your life. The background for the day's lesson is this. Paul founded the church at Philippi on his second missionary journey around 50 AD. Paul continued to start churches and help find folks around the neighborhood and in the, in, in the area around Philippi, helped them find Christ even through a third missionary journey. Now in 62 AD, Paul is in prison, most likely in Rome, awaiting his execution if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know why, for preaching and spreading the gospel. Uh, as I thought of this week's lesson, I thought of this, uh, and I heard this preached by our preacher, and our preacher's preaching a series of messages on the return of Jesus. But I fully believe uh, in the coming days, months, years, uh, even here in the USA, uh, we will not be able to have a Sunday school lesson like we're having right now without intervention or without persecution by our government. The leadership we have in place is leading down an evil path. And, and I thank God for the contentment we have by just having our Sunday school lesson each week. Uh, so Paul thinks back and he thinks back to the people back at Philippi. And he remembers when he started the church at Philippi. And when he left the church at Philippi, he encouraged the folks to stay there and always stand fast in the faith. Always stand for Christ. Stand firm in Christ. As part of their mission, they were always to continue to support Paul uh, in his work. Just like we do Danny, Adam, and our missionary in Israel. We're always supporting those to help spread the gospel even to those places that have not received the gospel yet. So let me remind you again how we started this lesson, or how we started this book of Philippi, by asking you to turn back with me to Philippians chapter 1, and let's look at the first three verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, who are in Philippi, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the verse I'm looking at. I thank my God upon every remembrance I have of you. Paul was thankful and he was also gracious for the people that were still standing by at the church at Philippi. He starts the book with, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now look with me now at Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministers to me, to my needs, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Rejoice him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Paul is thanking the church uh, at Philippi and he's thanking them for having took the opportunity for their church missions. They had sent Epaphroditus from Philippi to Rome with supplies and money 
and other necessary needs that Paul needed, like food uh, and so forth, to help him be able to overcome the time that he was spending in prison. Paul says here he thanks him. Now, Aphrodite had gotten sick while he was in prison with Paul. But now he was well, and he's sending him back to, to the people at Philippi. He had gotten over his sickness. Paul was now sending him back home with many, many rejoicing ideas. However, for him and his mission, Paul stays in prison. And he closes out in chapter 4 with our first section, which is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, remember while Epaphroditus was there, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you also lack, also careful, but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. To be content. Paul reports and re reports how happy he was to see when Epaphroditus came to see him. Simply put, he rejoiced in the Lord greatly when he saw it. Now Paul was in needing and wanting to hear again from the Philippians. But he says, maybe you have lacked opportunity to send me word. Why possibly had they lacked opportunity? As I study this week, I found, I think I wrote here three ways that maybe Paul felt like that they lacked opportunity. Maybe no one from the church at Philippi was able physically to make the physical journey from Philippi to Rome to see him and bring him what he needed. Remember, a thousand miles over land and sea to get from Philippi to Rome. At 20 miles a day, you're talking several months to get to it. So it was, of course, a long journey for a person. Maybe the folks at Philippi were using the funds they had to support the church and did not have anything extra left over to send to support Paul. Maybe Epaphroditus did not express the great need that Paul had when he returned for Paul's support in the prison. With all that said, Paul was still in prison and he had not received any word or any further supplies or needs or necessary wants from his church at Philippi. We, as humans may say, this situation would cause us maybe to be very discouraged. Not Paul. Paul says here, and he was quick in verse 11 to assure the Philippians that in whatsoever state he was, that he was content. He had learned to be content. Paul had learned in his ongoing relationship with Jesus that he would provide for his strength for every circumstance. As we learned last week, if we dwell on things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, and commendable, we can also, like Paul, have contentment. Then Paul goes on with the lesson today in his final chapter to the Philippians in verses 12, 13, and 14. And this is, pertains to all situation. It's probably some of the well, most well-known scripture in all of the Bible. A lot of people may quote this verse. I know both how to be a best and I know how to buy, be abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. For he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Three things are needed in supporting God's work. Available resources, a heart to help, and channels to dispense the resources. Paul had learned contentment and he applied it to all his situations while he was in prison. What situations did he have to endure? If his stomach was full or if he was hungry, he had learned how to be content. Whether he had plenty to make it through the next day or if he was in dire need, he had learned to be content because he knew Christ. Having been arrested for the fact that he was spreading the gospel, he had realized now 
that he had done what God had told him to do. And he was contented with where he was at, even though it was prison. But Paul then gives us the secret to his contentment. And it's a well-known verse, verse 413. Let me read that one more time. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. He can do all things through Christ. For without him, he would not even have the strength of the air or the breath to breathe or to stand up each day. Thus, he was not counting on gifts from the Philippi church, for he knew that Christ would give him more than human strength for whatever circumstances he would ever have to face while he's in prison. Paul so also did not want his friends at Philippi to, to think that he was begging them to send gifts and that it, gifts were not necessary. He was facing, surely, difficult circumstances. The teacher's book closes this section with this. Heaven's supply is more adequate for all earthly circumstances. Rule one, be happy and content with your personal relationship with Christ at all times. Rule two, if any doubt, refer to rule one. In the next section, Paul says we need to be happy and content through other believers. This comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 15, 16, 17. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, meaning the church at Philippi. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but as I desire fruit that may be abound to your account. Paul in these verses remembers the occasions when he was with them last. And he says, from there, from Philippi, I left there and went to Macedonia. And while I was there, you sent me gifts. And then I went on to Thessalonica. He remembers how at Thessalonica, the church at Philippi, once again, sent him gifts and support. Remember this, Paul says, I thank God that the church is mission-minded and generous to the spreading of the gospel that I'm trying to do. I did not know this to this week. Till studying this week, the church at Thessalonica had become known as a hostile church. So Paul says it was critical for him while he was there in order to survive that he received the gifts from Philippi because Thessalonica did not support him while working in the church at Thessalonica. In verse 17, Paul answers and assures them that he was not seeking gifts. In fact, he assures them that the theology of giving says, given in the right spirit enriches the giver. I have found myself uh, used to when I was a child, I couldn't wait to get things, and gifts and so forth, like at birthday or at, and at Christmas. But now I find greater joy, as Paul says here in this verse, I find greater joy in getting those gifts and giving them to someone else. Then Paul says we need to have a contented heart. Chapter 4, verse 18. But I have all in abound. I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Paul refers back to the gifts that Epaphroditus brought to him from the church at Philippi. Not only had the gifts been helpful, but much appreciated. In fact, he said they were like an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. A reminder that giving to advance the gospel is a sweet-smelling gift to God, to all believers of all ages. Not only had the gift suffered, sufficed his needs, but resulted in an, an abundance of contentment for him. I can remember over a year ago, uh, several years ago now, uh, I, had to have, I had to have foot surgery, and thus I was out of work and at home. I was teaching a Sunday school class at that time. 
And I can remember back to that day so very well uh, as a Sunday school teacher and working around the community. Uh, I had found out that it was such a get joy to take people gifts and go see them when they had surgery or when they'd been in the hospital and maybe take a meal to them. But at this time, while I was down, my Sunday school class sent a flower and brought a meal to our house. And I couldn't help but think, you know, I've been doing it for many, many folks, but I still felt empty or still felt, I tried to feel under, understand how I could feel now that I, I was able to, or was there in need of a flower and a gift. And my church and Sunday school brought that to me. I learned how content I was and how gracious it was that they sent me flowers and a meal. For I was on the other side of the gift, for you see, I was the receiver. Giving is a two-way street. There must be a giver and a receiver. I have another example for you. Uh, this past summer, you know, I had shoulder surgery, and for several months there, uh, I was not able to get out on a lawnmower or a tractor and cut my own grass. Uh, one Saturday as I was home, uh, this wonderful person came, took the time to cut my grass and also cut my neighbor's grass. As I tried to pay this person for doing it, I was given the money back and I was told this, I can't take your money. This is my gift and don't take my gift of giving to you away from me. So where you see it was my gift from that person for, for God to give to that man, person that cut my grass. Why then do you have gifts, givers, receivers, and so forth? Paul says in verses 19 and 20, it's for his glory. For God's glory is the title of this section. But my glory shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. As Paul draws his letter to the Philippians to a close, he asks for God's blessings to the Philippians for their gifts to him. God could for them what Paul could not do. He could do for them what Paul couldn't do because he was still in prison. Even as God met his needs, he prays for God to meet, help them meet their needs. Paul says God will provide everything according to his riches in glory. What does this mean? Is his provisions limited to the size of our needs? Is his provision based on the frequency or the fervency of our asking? Is his blessing based on our merit? No, it's based on his glory and what we do to shine glory upon God. I had a preacher tell me about how he was trying to work while he attended seminary school. There were some months he and his wife had some very bad dips in the financials, and he had some hills that he had to climb over. But each time he prayed to God for his needs, it seemed like he would always go to the mailbox and there was an envelope with some money in it. He never knew who was sending the money, but to that somebody wanted him to attend seminary so he could get to know God's word better and be able to preach it. He said once in a while he would find an envelope in his mailbox with money that he was always enough to help him get over the crisis of the month. He still remembers the glory he got and the glory that he gives God now by spreading his word in his preaching. Paul closes out Philippians in, chapter, in verse 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul was content because he had learned to trust God to supply all his needs. Now get this. If nothing else you've learned from today's last one. Contentment is not based on the abundance of material we have of earthly possessions. Contentment is based on the goodness and the things you have done for God here on earth. There's a song that says, count your blessings. I ask each of you this week, as we close out this book of Philippians and begin our next our book next week, to count your blessings in your life. But count those blessings that you feel with will be with you and go with you when you get to heaven 
Have you give something to your neighbor out of love? Have you shared the gospel to someone who didn't know Christ? Have you performed a mission project? What have you done for Jesus is the only thing that you can take to heaven. Then you will have and you will understand what Paul is talking about when he says, you can find joy and contentment in the situations that you are, are in here on earth. Be joyful, be contented, and I'll see you next week. Father, for this lesson, for the book of Philippians, we thank you. We thank you for giving us our blessings, Lord, while we're still here on earth. We pray in some way that you'll bless our church, Lord, help it to get to know you better. Help our church pastor and our song leader and those in our choir. Help the members of our church and Lord, help our deacons. Help them to get to know Christ better and bless them, Lord, for helping, for serving our church in the way they do. Forgive us of our sins, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. See you next week. Goodbye.